After finally finding its feet in its third season, Star Trek Enterprise at last became the prequel series it was supposed to be from the beginning, making meaningful contributions to canon and explaining how and why many things came to be in Star Trek history. Manny Koto, who had made a positive impact as co-executive producer in season three, was made showrunner for the fourth season, working alongside Rick Berman and Brannon Braga, and his influence was definitely felt and widely considered to be the primary reason for the creative success of season four. Unfortunately, the series was moved to the death slot of Friday nights, and the budget was also cut, although this was largely compensated for by the move to digital cameras. As a result, I don't believe that the budget cut negatively impacted season four all that much. The season opens with a spectacular two-part conclusion to the cliffhanger at the end of season three, Stormfront, in which the Enterprise crew, including Archer, are sent back through time to the Second World War. The timeline has been changed because an alien known as Vosk and his people have been stranded in the 20th century and are assisting the Nazis in exchange for materials to build a conduit to get back to the future. In this altered history, the Nazis have successfully taken over the eastern seaboard of the United States. The Enterprise crew and Archer were sent back in time to this point in history by Daniels to stop Vosk and to end the temporal Cold War once and for all. Archer works alongside a group of resistance fighters in Brooklyn, and he even has to enlist the help of his old enemy, Silic, who was also sent back in time. Stormfront Part 1 and 2 isn't perfect. I don't even think it's a great conclusion to the temporal Cold War story arc, but I do think it's a strong opening two-parter. Unfortunately, we don't find out who Future Guy was, which is a huge shame. But there's plenty of action, colour and energy in this two-parter to kick the season off with a bang. From a production standpoint, there are lots of great things here, from location shooting to visual effects and action set pieces. With Enterprise now back at Earth in the 22nd century once again, the third episode, Home, is a nice change of pace, with the crew celebrated for returning home triumphantly as heroes, but first, Archer has to go through a gruelling debriefing at Starfleet, where his actions in the Expanse are questioned by Saval. Archer snaps and Admiral Forrest orders him to take shore leave. Meantime, Earth isn't the same place it once was before they left for the Expanse. Humans are much less trusting of alien species after the Zindi incident, and Phlox comes face to face with some open hostility in a bar. Trip visits Vulcan with T'Pol. We meet her mother, who factors into the season later. Trip must watch as T'Pol marries Koss as a means of restoring her mother's position at the Vulcan Science Academy, which she lost after T'Pol's actions at the Bajem Sanctuary in season one. One thing that Enterprise always did very well was in-series continuity callbacks. Archer climbs a mountain with Captain Hernandez, an old flame, who is now the new commander of the NX-02 Columbia. Archer has become world-weary and cynical, given the extremely difficult decisions that he had to make in the Expanse, and the number of crewmen that he lost. Next up, in a major departure for the series, and indeed Star Trek, Enterprise introduced three-part story arcs, the first of which is a story centred around some augments, genetically engineered superhumans created by Arik Soong, an ancestor of Noonien Soong from The Next Generation, played brilliantly and fittingly by Brent Spiner. The augments are based on DNA left over from the eugenics wars, so this is tied into episodes like Space Seed and The Wrath of Khan. The Enterprise crew have to retrieve them before they kick off a war with the Klingons. It's an epic trilogy with serious consequences to be paid off later in the season. The next three-parter is a Vulcan-centric story arc, a quest for an ancient Vulcan artifact that could radically alter the future of Vulcan society. The Kirshara contains the true teachings of Surik, the spiritual leader of the Vulcan people, and if they were to become public, they could destabilize the corrupt ruling regime of the planet Vulcan. The episode deals with a major conspiracy to pin the blame for a terrorist attack on the Earth embassy on Vulcan, on a group known as the Cyrenites. They're a small breakaway faction of Vulcans who remain true to Surik's teachings, even practicing mind melds, which are largely forbidden in 22nd century Vulcan culture. In the search for the Cyrenites, Archer ends up getting Surik's Catra transferred into his mind, and T'Pol finds out that her mother is in fact a Cyrenite herself. The trilogy fixes the Vulcans, including Saval, making him a much more sympathetic and likable character. The Vulcans had, throughout Enterprise early run, 
been more like Romulans, suspicious and distrusting of humans, and also very judgmental of them. The Forge, Awakening and Kirshara are three episodes that transform the Vulcans into the ones we knew in the other series. Unfortunately, longtime semi-regular character Admiral Forrest, played by Von Armstrong, is killed saving Saval, although the character would return in the Mirror Universe later in the season. The season has two middling standalone episodes, The Observer Effect, featuring the Organians from the original series, and Daedalus, which deals with a story concerning Emery Erickson, the inventor of the Transporter. Babel 1, United, and the Enar form the third and final trilogy of the season, which is really the birth of the Federation story arc. The Romulans have a new drone ship that can make itself look like any vessel, and they use it to try to start a war between the Andorians, Tellarites, and humans in order to try to weaken their inevitable alliance. It's a brilliant and jam-packed story that features a lot of Jeffrey Combs as Shran, always welcome, and a visit to Andoria, including the first appearance of a second Andorian species known as the Enar, who would later make an appearance in Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Affliction and Divergence center on the fallout of the Augment story. The Klingons tried to use Augment DNA to make a new super soldier, but it goes awry and ends up creating a virus that infects millions of Klingons with human DNA, causing a mutation. At least from a cosmetic perspective, these Klingons appear to be more human, losing their forehead ridges. This is an explanation for why Klingons looked the way they did in the original series. Of course, the real reason the Klingons looked that way in the original series was because of the limitations of makeup and prosthetics at the time. But this in-universe explanation does tie neatly into an acknowledgement made in the DS9 episode Trials and Tribulations that the Klingons did indeed not look very Klingon in the 23rd century. They are Klingons, and it is a long story. What happened? Some kind of genetic engineering? A viral mutation? Actually, Dr. Bashir, the answer is both. While this is going on, Phlox is captured by Klingons and forced to work with them to find a cure. Trip is disillusioned after T'Pol spurns his romantic overtures and he requests a reassignment to the Columbia. And Malcolm Reed's secret past connections to Section 31 come to the surface, as he's forced to choose between his loyalties to Captain Archer and his former associates. This is a fantastic two-parter. Bound is a lighter tone episode, a wonderful throwback to the original series, with beautiful Orion slave women driving the men on the ship crazy due to their unique pheromones, enabling them to gain control of Enterprise. So that brings us to the most celebrated episodes of Enterprise, the two-parter In a Mirror Darkly, part one and two. A Mirror Universe episode that takes place entirely within the Mirror Universe, thus preserving canonical consistency. There is an ingenious opening sequence where we witness the divergence of the prime reality from the mirror universe. A scene from Star Trek First Contact is retconned whereby Zephram Cochran shoots the first Vulcan from the Vulcan ship and the humans seize control of it. This changes history. Even the opening credits are changed to reflect the fact that this is a different universe. The Terran Empire is being overrun by rebel forces and Captain Maximilian Forrest is in command of the ISS Enterprise, but faces mutiny and betrayal all around him. Because, of course, this is the Mirror Universe, where everyone is darker and evil versions of themselves. Commander Archer, his first officer, lusts for power and briefly takes control of the ship, locking them on course for a Tholian base where a future starship from the Prime Reality is being kept. It's the USS Defiant. No, not that one. The Defiant from the original series episode, The Tholian Web which was lost in interphasic space and pulled back in time into the Mirror Universe when the Tholians trapped it there. So they take control of this Constitution-class sister ship of the Enterprise in the hope they can put down the Rebellion once and for all. These episodes are a wonderful celebration of Star Trek's history, with a perfectly recreated original series bridge identical, of course, to Kirk's Enterprise. The next two-parter, Demons and Terra Prime, again ties into the ongoing Birth of the Federation story arc, with an anti-alien organization called Terra Prime who wish to see all non-humans removed from planet Earth. The primary antagonist in this story is a man named John Frederick Paxton, played by Robocop's Peter Weller, 
who would of course go on to play Admiral Marcus in Star Trek Into Darkness. A child has also been born in a lab by combining the DNA of Commander Tucker and Paul, the first half-human, half-Vulcan ever. Paxton and his people gain control of the Vertoron Array on Mars, and they threaten to destroy Starfleet headquarters in San Francisco if their demands are not met. The United Coalition of Planets is now in jeopardy, and Archer and the Enterprise crew have to once again save the day in the nick of time. Terra Prime is often cited by many fans as a more worthy farewell for the Enterprise cast and the true series finale, given just how disappointing these are the voyages turned out to be. Each character gets an important moment in Terra Prime that pays tribute to them, and I think everyone gets to be heroic in their own way in this story. The actual series finale, as I mentioned, These Are the Voyages, is something I've already reviewed pretty comprehensively in another video called What Went Wrong with These Are the Voyages, and I will include that video linked below so as not to repeat myself. But as I said in that video, the idea of an episode told from the perspective of a future Star Trek crew looking back at the events of Enterprise via the holodeck is a solid idea, it just doesn't work as a series finale, and of course, Trip Tucker's totally contrived death was absolutely awful and unnecessary. But the less said about These Are the Voyages, the better. Season 4 of Enterprise has so many great highlights, and it really is a great example of fan service done right. To this day, I'm still sore about Enterprise being cancelled prematurely. It deserved a fifth season. It had finally hit its stride and become the series it was meant to be. But nevertheless, in its four-year run, it contributed some high-quality and memorable stories to the franchise. And in my view, Season 4 is arguably the best and most consistent season of Star Trek ever produced. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Please subscribe if you're new. Thank you very much for watching. Take care, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. The Dave Cullen Show is made possible by you, my generous subscribers. If you'd like to support my work, head on over to my subscribe star linked below in the description box. And for a pledge of as little as $1 per month, you can help to keep the show going. I'm also doing one-to-one -one monthly subscriber chats. Thanks again. Take care.